Tommy O'Connor was an interesting character. Both he and his brother, Darling Dave O'Connor had, at least according to legend, once studied for the priesthood, although considering O'Connor, overall, that seems highly improbable. He was born the son of Joseph and Elizabeth Roach O'Connor in Ireland in 1891 in Garden Field, near Monahea, Limerick in a place called Scanlon's Fields, which is not a field but a geographic area. Locally the area is called Temple Mamona, and a house dubbed Moina Ged, which means the Bog of the Goose. The family arrived in Chicago in 1893 when Tommy was two years old. His siblings included John, a union electrician, was born in Ireland in 1887. John, like his sister Mary, lived a legitimate life as a lifelong bachelor. He died in Elgin, Illinois in 1936. Brother Dave was dubbed Darlin' Dave by the newspapers, although it's unlikely anyone ever actually called him Darlin' Dave. He was better known as Dapper Dave along LaSalle Street where he worked. He was also born in Ireland in 1889. As a teen, David took a job as a mail runner on the wheat exchange for Logan and Brian and eventually became a broker. He seemed to be going places until 1918 when he was arrested, tried, and convicted for immoral conduct. The incident a college professor of languages named Louis Alberto, who wore a frock coat and carried a gold-tipped cane, helped Dave O'Connor out of a messy divorce when he told the court that he had kissed and fondled O'Connor's wife, Ethel Rose. According to Ethel Rose, who married O'Connor in 1912, Alberto lured her to his apartment, got her drunk, had her dress in a kimono, turned on the Victrola, and was dancing with her in the bedroom when Dave O'Connor and a police detective rushed into the room, hence catching them in the act. Based on Alberto's testimony, which was backed up by the police detective's testimony, O'Connor was exempted from alimony payments higher than $75 a month. During the divorce proceedings, Ethel Rose told the court that O'Connor had carried on a multitude of affairs. She said that she had uncovered a batch of love letters from a young woman to her husband, with each referring to O'Connor as My Darling Dave and the name stuck. That was in 1912. In 1918, O'Connor and Alberto were accused of taking a 15-year-old girl named Irene Myers to a bar, getting her drunk, and then raping her. It took two trials to convict O'Connor to a year in prison and the temporary loss of his broker's license, and the facts surrounding the case appear to support O'Connor's claim that Miss Myers was an extortion artist, a professional hustler, mature far beyond her years. As much as anything, by that time, the public's hatred for Dave's flamboyant brother Tommy, widely considered an arrogant and merciless cop killer, convicted Dave O'Connor. The state Supreme Court later overturned the case, but by then Dave O'Connor was forced to sell his seat on the exchange for $7,000 to pay his legal fees. He spent the rest of his life on the right side of the law, became a highly successful commodities broker, completed a year of college, and lived with his wife Gladys, whom he had met on the L on his way to work in 1916, while she was a student at the exclusive Belmont College for Women in Nashville, Tennessee. His parent and mother-in-law, Laubda Heistand, lived with the couple in affluent Oak Park and later Maine, Illinois. Tommy O'Connor's father was, by all accounts, a loving family man who worked two jobs most of his life and early on saved up enough money to buy a modest house on West 13th Street near Paulina Street. Despite his reputation as a lifelong thug, Tommy O'Connor was unknown to the police until he was 21 years old. He more than probably fell into a life of crime through his childhood friend, a tough hood named Jimmy Charon, whose father, Dominic Charon, was a political ward healer and small-time gangster who owned a seedy saloon. The police believed that the saloon was actually a front for the elder Charon to fence stolen goods and was certain that most of his customers were criminals. In their late teens, Tommy O'Connor and the younger Charon became regulars at Charon's saloon where they met Tribbley Thompson, a legendary criminal in the Valley neighborhood, who took them under his wing and taught them how to steal cars. Unlike O'Connor, Charon became a protege of Trilby Thompson and Thompson's mentally unbalanced partner in crime, Eddie Ammunition Weed. They became quick pals largely because all three were set to indulge in opium and cocaine. Frank Trilby Thompson, the leader of a car thief gang as well as an armed highway robbery. He escaped from Joliet Prison in October of 1913 with a Valley neighborhood crook named William Sonny Dunn and another hood named Vic Sanders. Both Sanders and Dunn were quickly captured. The chief of police, who had the unfortunate name of Wiene, told his men to bring in Thompson, dead or alive. But Thompson brazenly walked the streets thumbing his nose at the law. On April 21, 1917, the Tribbley Thompson Weed Gang robbed a bar at 418 Wells Street, murdering bartender Tommy Connolly, without cause. The entire take was less than $300. 
Then on July 13, 1917, the gang robbed the Chicago City Bank and Trust at 6233 South Halstead, killing police officer Peter Bolfin in the process. One of the four men involved in the robbery was a thug named Big Danny Romano, a driver, and gofare for Barney Grogan, who was later suspected of hiding Tommy O'Connor after O'Connor's prison escape. Another part of the robbery gang that day was Jimmy Charon. The gang also robbed the Winslow Brothers' payroll robbery of about $12,000. On September 1st, 1917, we stood off 250 Chicago policemen for two hours from a shack on his mother's property on Thomas Street. When police finally forced him to give up, Weed was found with several revolvers, a shotgun, a rifle, a battery of knives, 500 cartridges of steel jacketed bullets, 300 shotgun shells, and two bottles of nitroglycerin, a favorite among safe burglars. This gun-toting habit of mine, Weed said, is the cause of my downfall. The incident was deadly that it later brought about the formation of the Chicago Crime Commission from jail Weed wrote a diary, an underworld lingo, which he handed over to the state's attorney's office, admitting to 30 robberies in Chicago and 20 more in other cities. Most of the diary was gibberish and mad ravings, enough so that Weed's lawyer, Robert L. Cohan, insisted that Weed was insane and should be committed to an insane-based asylum based only on the written confession. Weed solidified his lawyer's statement by rushing at several witnesses and wrestling with two bailiffs before he was chained at his wrists and ankles and led out of the courtroom. On February 15, 1918, at 9 in the morning, Weed was hung by his neck until dead. He went to the gallows cool and calm. Minutes before he was executed, he told a reporter, I am an anarchist, but I am a devout Catholic who believes in God. I go to church when there is no danger from the police. I say my prayers on my knees every night. But the world is upside down. It is filled with injustice. The rich have everything and the poor have nothing. I have never robbed a poor man. I am no cheap stick-up artist who lurks at the mouth of an alley for chance victims who may not have more than 30 cents in their pocket. I rob only the rich who can afford to lose money. I play for the big game. I stake my life against the gold. If I lose, I lose my life during all this. Tommy O'Connor was working mostly on small-time crimes. Physically, there was not much to Tommy O'Connor. He stood five foot seven and weighed 138 pounds. Dr. Francis McNamara, once the medical director of the Cook County Jail, recalled that O'Connor's hair stood up on his head like a crown or as if he had just seen a ghost. He had high-inched eyebrows that gave him a constant startled expression. He always looked as if he was frightened, and I believe he was most of the time. As the day fixed for his execution, this look became more intense. He was a coward, of this I am certain. There were lines of nervous tension on his lean cheeks. He only fought when cornered, like a rat, or when he could take his victim by surprise. Once, before he was famous, he threatened to kill a police officer on sight. Officer Herman Otten, a detective sergeant with the West 13th Street Station. On February 3, 1913, Otten shot and killed Jimmy Higgins. James Henry Higgins, a stick-up artist who specialized in robbing bars, was one of the Trilby Thompson gang's top men until he was shot and killed in 1913 while robbing Harry Martini's saloon in the valley. The bar had once been owned by Jimmy Charon's father, Dominic, although it is likely that Dominic still held a stake in the place. Higgins and another hood named Billy Cantwell were robbing Harry Martini's saloon at 2000 Ogden Avenue. Reading the newspapers of the day, it seems that Martini's was robbed on a monthly basis. The pair were in the midst of forcing the bar customers into the freezer when Officer Otten and a Detective Morrissey entered the bar. Higgins drew on Detective Otten, but Otten fired first, putting a bullet through Higgins's forehead. As for Billy Cantwell, the other robber, he was beaten so severely that he had to be taken to a nearby hospital. According to police, Higgins and Cantwell were paid $25 each to rob the bar by Martini's former business partners, the Gill Brothers. The Gills ran a successful bar with Martini at 1055 Ogden Avenue. Since Martini was a convicted criminal and unable to get a license to operate a saloon, the Gills held the license in their name, but allowed Martini to run the bar and took most of the profits. Martini grew discouraged and talked a brewery into paying to open his saloon on 2000 Ogden and placing the license in their name. Feeling cheated, the Gills paid Higgins and Cantwell to rob the place. It wasn't the first time that the Gills had paid to have Martini robbed. On New Year's Day, 1913, Trilby Thompson, a regular at the Gills' saloon escape, came out of hiding and robbed Martini's at gunpoint at 3.30 in the afternoon. He also robbed the patrons telling them, put him up and put up now, this is my busy day. 
Police Detective George Gary happened upon the scene. As Trilby Thompson fled out the back door, Gary pulled out his service revolver only to have the gun misfire twice. Trilby Thompson was suspected of killing a policeman during a daylight robbery in January of 1916. Deputy Chief of Police Schwedler offered a $5,000 reward to anyone who would lead the police to Trilby Thompson's hideout. In turn, Trilby Thompson sent Schwedler a note reading come and take me. I have consumption and I am dying, but I would like to kill a few policemen first Schwedler was a brave man. When Tommy O'Connor sent him a note promising to kill him on sight because a few years before he had arrested the now dead James Higgins, one of Tommy O'Connor's pals and mentors. The officer put the note in his pocket and went in search of the young bandit. When he found O'Connor, Schwedler deliberately spat in his face and then turned on his heel and walked away and O'Connor did not have the nerve to shoot him, not even in the back. Tommy O'Connor was also a burglar and, like the Tui brothers who were his childhood friends, drove a taxi at night as a cover because it gave him a legitimate reason for being in any neighborhood at any time of the day or night. O'Connor, who introduced his friend Tommy Tui, the future leader of the Tui gang, to his love of nitroglycerin, which the Tui brothers used to blow safes during their burglary years between 1900 and 1924, before prohibition turned them into bootleggers and killers. Three of the five Tui brothers were missing several fingers due to poor handling of nitroglycerin during robberies they committed. Just prior to joining the so called Emerson gang, Tommy O'Connor may have done some work with the Gloriana gang, led by Long Charlie Gloriana, that was mostly Italian but occasionally allowed in an Irishman to round out their association of burglars, stick up artists, and payroll robbers. O'Connor was also suspected of robbing the Southwest Side Saving Bank where police officer Edward Flynn was shot. Tommy O'Connor met William Ray Emerson, a.k.a. Babe, and Harry Harrison at the Charon Saloon when Emerson was on the run after escaping from the Minnesota State Prison. While on the run, Emerson robbed the Illinois Central Ticket Office on Park Row in Chicago. After that, he put a gang together that included Abraham Schaffner, a safe blower and bank robber. On August 14, 1910, Schaffner, then a teen, was arrested on charges of horse thievery, burglary, and swindling. The others in the gang included James Hanratty, a former prize fighter turned criminal, and George Raymond, a knockaround guy who robbed the Astor restaurant in 1913. During that robbery, a police detective leaped in Raymond's way as he tried to escape, but Raymond pulled out a revolver and pulled the trigger several times, but the weapon locked each time. He was arrested and convicted of attempted murder, but somehow got the charge dismissed. At the end of the year, he was arrested and convicted of robbery, served four years, and was paroled with a clean record. A month later, he killed a policeman during a robbery of the Normal Avenue Saloon at gunpoint. Emerson was planning to rob the safe in the city treasury in Town Hall. But gang member James Hanratty, the former price fighter turned criminal, suggested instead that they rob the Illinois Central Railroad. Hanratty went over the details and told the gang, which consisted of Emerson, Abe Schaffner, and Willie Sharkey, a mentally unbalanced thug who later worked for Roger Tui as a hired gun, Tommy O'Connor, George Raymond, the man who had killed the policeman during the robbery of the Normal Avenue Saloon. Emerson, who later told police he played no active role in the robbery, said that after it was decided to rob the railway depot, which they did, on February 1st, 1918. The gang decided to steal a getaway car, but that went awry so they walked to the taxi stand at Union Station and hailed a cab which was driven by an innocent man named Jimmy Pelican. The gang arrived late to the depot, at 10 o'clock. Cash collections at the depot started at 8.54 and the collection route had ended. However, they spotted a depot employee named Dennis E. Tierney, an ex-policeman and the collector of the daily ticket sales funds, carrying that night's collection through the depot alongside a guard named Quinney. Emerson said that he and Tommy O'Connor were supposed to jump the armed guard accompanying Tierney and that Raymond was supposed to handle Tierney alone. But Raymond was late, so Emerson walked up to the guard, Quinney, and put a gun to his head and searched him but found no pistol on him. Quinney's pistol was in a holster that had slid onto his back when Emerson grabbed him from behind and Emerson had only frisked the front of Quinney's body. Quinney later identified Tommy O'Connor as very nervous and whistled through most of the robbery at the same time. Tommy O'Connor jumped Tierney, the man carrying the cash, and struck him over the head with the butt of his gun and tried to wrestle him to the ground, but Tierney was considerably larger than the slightly built O'Connor and easily put O'Connor on his back on the floor. At that point, all of the robbers had their weapons in their hands. Emerson joined the fray to help Tommy O'Connor and beat Tierney over the head with his pistol. Emerson said that O'Connor finally got control of the black leather money bag and ran out of the depot just as Raymond arrived. 
the cash satchel was said to contain $2,500 in small bills. Another figure was $1,500. Emerson said that he and O'Connor were out of the building by then and that they heard shooting. However, witnesses said that Tierney, the clerk who had carried the money bag, staggered to his feet, drew a weapon he had hidden in his belt, and fired, and that Emerson and O'Connor turned and returned fire. One bullet hit Tierney in the upper right breast, killing him. Leaping into the waiting cab, O'Connor yelled at the driver, Get the hell out of here, and fast, if you don't want your head shot off. Emerson put then his gun to the driver's head and told him, Take orders from me, and you'll be all right. If you don't, you're a dead one, because I'll croak you seconds later, Emerson said. Raymond flew down the depot stairs with Quinny, the depot guard, in hot pursuit. Raymond fell and tumbled down several stairs, and Emerson leaped out of the car and pulled Raymond into the back seat and yelled for the driver to take off. At that second Quinny, the armed guard fired off a shots at them, emptying his chamber, probably grazing one of the robbers since a bloody cap was later found at the scene. Emerson returned fire and started screaming at the driver faster, and a minute later they barely escaped a head-on collision with a streetcar at Randolph and State Streets. A block after that O'Connor gave the driver $40, put the car in neutral and pushed him out onto the street, took the wheel, and floored it. As they drove away, Raymond said that I threw five slugs at the guy, meaning Tierney. And I think I bumped him off. A few years later corrupt newspaper reporter Jake Lingle would also be murdered not far from where Tierney fell dead. Emerson was renting a room in a boarding house at 4140 West Monroe Street run by Mrs. Tilly Sullivan, who had once been arrested for her role in a bank robbery that included a very young George Bugs Moran. The gang gathered at Sullivan's boarding house and divided up the loot on the kitchen table in front of Mrs. Sullivan. They each tipped Mrs. Sullivan $10 and let her keep the coins from the robbery, and then they split up, each $350 richer. Emerson and Raymond spent the night at the home of gangster Big Tim Murphy after stopping to have chop suey at a restaurant on Paulina Street. Emerson said that Raymond was a friend of Murphy's and that Raymond said to Murphy, well, I guess I croaked a guy tonight on February 3rd, 1918, after a vicious gun battle that left two policemen dead. George Raymond was killed by police after a tip led them to the gang's hideout on 4140 West Monroe Street. There the police found the black leather bag taken from Tierney at the depot. Arrested on the spot were Raymond's friend and partner in crime George Bugs Moran and the gang's leader, Emerson. Emerson was eventually tried and convicted and was sentenced to 30 years in prison. While he was in custody and already facing a long sentence in Minnesota on a different charge, Emerson probably tried to cut a deal and started naming names and one of the names he gave was George Raymond, but then he found out that Raymond was dead and the cops wanted Tommy O'Connor. So Emerson pointed the finger at Tommy O'Connor for killing Tierney and beating Quincy the guard at the depot. Emerson told a good tale. He said that prior to robbing the ticket office, he had warned O'Connor not to bring a weapon on the job. According to Emerson, it was O'Connor who turned and shot Tierney in the chest, killing him. What did you do that for? Emerson said, asked O'Connor. Because I felt like it, O'Connor was said to have replied and then stuck the pistol in Emerson's ribs and said, if you don't like it, I'll give the same to you. He added that he believed that O'Connor had panicked. Lack of color and drama were not lacking in Emerson's tale. Emerson was the only person to accuse O'Connor of firing the fatal shot. On November 12, 1918, O'Connor, the most wanted man in Chicago, was arrested during a robbery and promptly offered to cut a deal with the police. He said he would finger Harry Emerson as the cop killer, but the state's attorney turned down Tommy's offer. They already had Emerson pointing the finger at O'Connor and O'Connor, and the yes of the law was a much larger catch than Emerson and they told O'Connor as much. Released on bond, O'Connor decided that Emerson had to die before he, O'Connor, went on trial. Supposedly, and there are many versions of the story, O'Connor asked his pal Jimmy Chirin to visit Joliet Prison where Emerson was being held and stab him to death with a knife, claiming self-defense. The second most popular version of the story is that O'Connor told Sharon to take $200 in cash to Bugs Moran, who was in jail with Emerson, as a down payment for the assassination of Harry Emerson. Sharon, his father said later, refused the offer, telling O'Connor that he had promised his father he would go straight, so O'Connor killed him. Or so his father, another common criminal, said and added that O'Connor bullied his son into a life of crime. But young Charon, the peacock of the underworld, and the bad boy of the west side was a far cry from a weakling who could be pushed around by tiny Tommy O'Connor. In fact, 
Considering Charon's willingness to use his sizable brawn and fists in any circumstance and O'Connor's weak knees and small stature, it was the other way around. Charon had already had a very long criminal record that included a stint at Bidwell Prison when he started robbing with O'Connor. Charon was widely hated in the underworld because of his habit of agreeing to 1% of the take from a burglary and then demanding a larger share after the job was done. If the other half refused, Charon clubbed them and in some cases, shot them. Charon's first arrest came in 1911 when he was 13 years old. A year later, on December 18, 1912, when Charon was 114, he was identified by over 15 witnesses as the kid who held up a cigar store at 2002, West 12th Street at gunpoint and escaped with $1,500. Sharon's intended victim seems to have been a big-time gambler named Jacob Goldman. Apparently, Sharon, who lived with his father at 1121 South Lincoln Street. Sharon's father's saloon was on the first floor. He followed Goldman into the cigar store and decided to rob the store as well. The papers reported that Charon's father was indignant at the assertion by the police that his son was a stick-up artist despite the fact that young Charon had already served at least one term in the Bibble prison for sticking up 25 men at one time and racked up another 20 arrests overall. Jimmy Charon got away with most of his minor crimes because the cops liked him and because his father Dominic Charon was a municipal court bailiff and part-time crook and local political figure who was willing to pay off to keep his son out of jail. When that failed, he fixed the records for him or called in a favor from the cops to let his son walk away from a charge. He blamed all of his son's deadly habits on the neighborhood he raised him in. But the cops and judges were growing tired of looking the other way. Jimmy the Peacock, they said, was out of control. Then Jimmy's girlfriend, Adelaide, got pregnant and Jimmy married her. He told his new wife and his father that he had decided to settle down and go legit. It was a lie, of course. Sharon went into gambling instead, which he deemed to be a step up from armed robbery. On January 21, 1919, Sharon's body was found in the back seat of a stolen Model T car on 79th Street and State Road in the town of Stickney. He had been shot three times under the left ear, a pistol in his right hand was unfired. The corpse was identified by Detective Charlie McShane of the Auto Detail. The original source of the story that O'Connor killed Charon's came from Charon's father, but it appears that his son may have been killed in a gambler's war that ripped the West Side that year. The turf war was between the Stillwell mob and the Jimmy Charon gang. About five months later, on June 4, 1919, Jimmy Charon's 20-year-old wife, Adelaide, killed herself and her three-year-old daughter. Their bodies were found in bed at their apartment at 1121 South Lincoln Street. One newspaper story stated that she held a newspaper clipping about Charon in her hand, but this seems to be a romanticized tidbit planted by reporters. Charon's father said that she had been having problems with the gas being turned off for non-payment and that the death was accidental. But the version of the story that sold more papers was the one that essentially blamed the murderous Tommy O'Connor for driving a child bride to kill herself by murdering her well-meaning, honest husband. On November 13, 1919, O'Connor indicted for the murder of Dennis Tierney at the train depot. Police arrested O'Connor at his father's home at 3329 West 16th Street. When police arrived, O'Connor was in bed fast asleep. The state had a rock-solid case, and it all rested on Harry Emerson's testimony. Four days later, on November 17, 1920, Harry Emerson, who had already escaped from the Minnesota State Prison, escaped from Menard State Prison in southern Illinois while being transported to a hearing in Chicago. Without Emerson, the state had no case against O'Connor, and so on April 9, 1920, O'Connor was acquitted of the murder of Dennis Tierney. Aside from a missing key witness, somehow, O'Connor's defense managed to produce three witnesses who swore O'Connor was with them in Houston, Texas on the day of the shooting. As soon as O'Connor was acquitted, he was indicted for his role in the depot robbery. Using his own criminal connections, Jimmy Charon's father learned that Louis J. Miller was his son's actual killer and would be arrested later that day. So the elder Charon kidnapped Miller from a Montrose Avenue saloon and brought to police headquarters where he was booked for the murder of Jimmy Charon and where, after a beating, he swore that he had seen Tommy O'Connor gun down Jimmy the Peacock. In his first statement, Miller, of Valley Hood, told the same story about the Charon killing that Charon's father had been telling people. He said he was sitting in the front seat of the car. The three of them were laughing and joking when suddenly O'Connor stopped laughing, turned to Jimmy the Peacock, and pumped three shots from an army service revolver into the young man's temple. He said Jimmy the Peacock died immediately. 
He then added that O'Connor barked at Miller to drive to Stickney, a town just south of Chicago, and find an empty ditch where they would dump the body. Miller did as he was told. Based on that miraculous testimony, detectives picked up Tommy O'Connor and booked him for the murder of Jimmy the Peacock Charons based on Miller's statements. O'Connor was able to post the $45,000 bail, which was the largest bail ever required in Chicago at that time. O'Connor disappeared as soon as he was released. On March 23, 1921, Detective Sergeant Patrick O'Neill got a tip that O'Connor was hiding out at the home of his brother-in-law, William Foley, married to O'Connor's sister Mary, at 6415 South Washtenaw Avenue. The first official version was that five police detectives circled the house and Officer O'Neill called inside for Tommy to surrender. According to the police, O'Connor burst through the door, guns blazing, and yelled, Well, I'll get one of you anyway, and then fired five shots. Officer O'Neill was standing in the center of the yard and was taken off guard by the suddenness of the attack. O'Connor cut him down before he could point the pistol in his hand and fell dead. Detectives Tom McShane, Joe Ronan, and William Finn started shooting the very second O'Connor raced out the door. At that second, the police drew their weapons and fired. Badly rattled the detectives stood over O'Neill's body weeping Joe. Joe! Oh, God! Meanwhile, Tommy O'Connor leaped over a fence at the rear of his sister's yard and ran toward 63rd and Western where, at gunpoint, he leaped into a checkered cab and was driven a mile before leaping out. He then commandeered another car driven by a man named William Condon who drove O'Connor to Stickney where one of his O'Connor's friends ran a saloon. There he was provided with clothes and food. Exactly what actually happened on that back porch will never be known. The police officer's version of O'Connor bursting through the door shooting seems highly dramatic and very much out of character for O'Connor who was, to put it simply, something of a coward when it came to a fair fight. The police and a dozen witnesses all agreed that the police and O'Connor were less than 15 feet away from each other and that the police were grouped closely together, yet only one bullet of the five O'Connor was said to have fired struck only Officer O'Neill. It appears that what actually happened was that O'Neill led three detectives up to the front door, their pistols were drawn, and a fourth detective circled around the front of the house. O'Connor walked out onto the porch and asked Officer O'Neill what he wanted and that was when the shooting started. Witnesses said that the detectives behind O'Neill pulled their weapons and accidentally killed O'Neill and that the fourth detective who had gone around the other side of the house ran towards the other men, firing wildly. Six days after the shootout, on March 28, 1921, at 3 in the morning, a squad of heavily armed police, acting on a tip, surrounded a house on Belmont Avenue in Chicago, hoping to capture Tommy O'Connor, who was said to be in the house, sleeping. He wasn't there, but minutes later there was a call that O'Connor was sitting in a car on Halstead and the squad rushed there, again finding no sign of O'Connor. Later that day, the four detectives who were suspended from the force for lying about what happened during the bungled O'Connor arrest. At an inquest into the bungled attempt to arrest O'Connor, the officers involved pointed fingers of blame at each other and contradicted each other's statements. It was said one of the hearing judges the worst case of dog-eat-dog dog I have ever seen among the press. The rumors were that it was, as O'Connor said, one of the officers, probably Ronan, who panicked and killed Officer O'Neill. In his formal report on the incident, the chief of police wrote that after O'Neill was shot, the officer watched from a distance of cover as O'Neill cried out for help, struggled to his feet, and collapsed. Fifty witnesses agreed with the chief's summary that the policemen stayed in hiding while O'Neill cried to Officer Ronan Joe. Joe! Dear God help me! But the cops stayed in hiding until the ambulance arrived and remained undercover until the ambulance attendants placed O'Neill in the ambulance. He died 25 minutes later in the hospital. None of that matter. The public, via the newspapers, were convinced that little Tommy O'Connor had not only murdered the otherwise innocent Jimmy the Peacock Charon, but he had also killed Officer O'Neill in cold blood. A week later, on April 4, 1921, the police received a tip that a drunken Tommy O'Connor was at the Crystal Palace Dance Hall dressed, for some reason, as a woman. The police raided the bar and searched everyone, including the dancers, but O'Connor wasn't found. In the meantime, a stick-up artist named George Boland was robbing people on the street, telling his victims that he was terrible Tommy O'Connor. On April 11, 1921, five carloads of heavily armed police raided a cottage at 3347 16th Street down the road from O'Connor's father's house on a tip that Tommy was hiding there. In the house was O'Connor's cousin, Jeannie O'Connor, and her daughter Mary. When police kicked in the door, Jeannie O'Connor flung herself at the lead police officer and landed several hard punches on his head before she was restrained. 
again, Tommy O'Connor was not there. On June 22, 1921, three police detectives were working a tip that Tommy O'Connor was seen several times in the Valley neighborhood around 14th and Hastings streets. The cops waited on 13th and Roby streets when a car without a license plate drove past. The police put on the siren, but the car without the plate came to a standstill and let out a volley of bullets and sped away. By July 1921, O'Connor left Chicago and had made his way to Minneapolis and brought a train ticket to Omaha. He had been drinking heavily. Once on the train, he yelled for a porter to bring another beer, and when it was served, O'Connor pulled out a pistol and told the porter to be quiet and ran to the back of the car shouting for the engineer to stop the train. When the train stopped, O'Connor leaped from the car and tried to board another engine car, but the firefighter, W.L. Woods, knocked O'Connor onto his rear end with one mighty swing of his shovel. O'Connor stood, bleeding, and tried to board another train but was overpowered by the fireman and an engineer who relieved him of his two pistols, a .32 in his hip pocket and a .45 carried in a specially designed vest pocket along with six clips of bullets. He was also carrying a rosary, a scapular, and a prayer card to St. Patrick. In O'Connor's view of events, he said that I got drunk and fell into a quarrel with a porter and fell off the train. The police furnished the three guns. I never had them on me, I would weigh a ton if I did. It was the Minneapolis newspapers that named O'Connor Terrible Tommy causing O'Connor to complain what right did the Minneapolis newspaper have to call me that? I've been made more notorious than Jesse James. On July 30th, 1921, a squad of heavily armed detectives was sent to St. Paul to bring O'Connor back to Chicago. It was an illegal transport, but since O'Connor was an alleged cop killer, no policeman in Chicago or St. Paul really cared about his civil rights. However, the state of Minnesota was charging O'Connor with an earlier payroll robbery and wanted him to stay in their state to stand charges. But the Chicago cops took O'Connor out of the city with such speed that the city attorney, Floyd Olson, formally charged Chicago Chief of Detectives Hughes with kidnapping. Olson sent three carloads of his detectives to Chicago to bring O'Connor back, but they were turned away at the city border. Chief Hughes, who would always refer to O'Connor as the Rat, explained that he didn't have time to gather the correct extradition papers since he had heard in the underworld that burglar Tommy Tui was planning to shoot O'Connor's way to freedom. Tommy Tui, who was dangerously unhinged, would eventually pick up Tommy O'Connor's nickname Terrible Tommy, except in Tommy Tui's case the name was actually true. On the way back to Illinois, O'Connor told the Chicago police it wasn't my revolver that killed him. He, Officer O'Neill, was shot down by his own pals. It was a mistake, of course, but they shot him, and after that mistake, they ran away and put the blame on me. Do you wonder why I ran away? What chance did I have with every policeman in the city out to get me dead or alive? Me, the con, only 138 pounds? I never shot anybody, at least not to kill, in my life. But, a reporter asked you admitted to killing Tierney. No, O'Connor answered what I said was that they had me right in that case. I meant robbery, but you newspaper boys wanted me guilty so you understood that I said they had me right and while we're on it, I did not kill my good and dear friend Jimmy Charon later. During the trip home, O'Connor asked Chief Hughes, you won't murder me if you take me back, will you? No, Hughes answered, we're just going to hang you, that's all, and Chicago O'Connor would be represented by the infamous lawyer, W.W. W. O'Brien, whose law partner was William Scott Stewart, defense attorney to the underworld. The firm's clients included Roger and Tommy Tui, most of the North Side gang including Hemi Weiss. Both Stewart and O'Brien were models for a composite character Billy Flynn in the stage play and film Chicago. On August 1, 1921, speaking from his jail cell, a smiling and optimistic Tommy O'Connor told reporters that he was worried about his upcoming trial since was innocent and held to his claim that the police themselves accidentally shot Officer O'Neill. I've had so much publicity since that O'Neill affair I'd have no trouble getting a job as a screen star, he told the press in Minneapolis, everybody including the mayor came by to shake my hand. The girls were very nice too. Five days later, on August 6, 1921, Officer James Rafferty of Highland Park identified O'Connor as the man who shot him on the night of April 10, 1921. That Rafferty had been ordered to stop and question all suspicious cars. He stopped a Packard on the corner of St. John's and Central Avenue. Someone was huddled in the back seat and Rafferty showed his flashlight on the person and asked, Who are you? The man sprang forward and shot the cop in the chest and the car sped away. Rafferty claimed he knew O'Connor and could identify him as his shooter. The entire Rafferty issue was very suspicious. He refused to press charges against O'Connor and then disappeared for several weeks and had to be brought into jailhouse by Chicago police to identify O'Connor. 
the most damaging testimony came on September 21, 1921, when Tommy's first cousin, Mary Mill Lane, and her husband Cornelius, and her 10-year-old daughter, testified that O'Connor came to their house at 1726 Wellington Avenue on the day of the O'Neill killing and told them that he had been in a shooting with police and left a while later armed with two pistols. On September 25, 1921, O'Connor was found guilty and sentenced to hang. The jury was out for three hours and took two ballots to decide Tommy's fate. The verdict was read at 2.12 in the afternoon. When it was read, O'Connor's father, David, rose to his feet in shock. It's the wrongest verdict in the world, he said later we couldn't get no justice for our boy. No justice on October 15, 1921, Judge Kickham Scanlon denied O'Connor a new trial, and the decision and the death sentence was stayed. O'Connor was ordered to be held in the criminal courts building until his hanging. From his cell there, he could hear the scaffolding of the hangman's platform being built. O'Connor was scheduled to hang for the O'Neill murder on December 15. On December 8, 1921, the state Supreme Court refused to hear his case, and all the while O'Connor repeated his story that the police shot O'Neill. On December 15, 1921, a man, believed to be Tommy Tui, was seen driving his car to a street outside of the criminal courts building where O'Connor was being held. The man parked and then walked up and down the street outside the jail and then tossed a package into an open window. Most believe it was the guns O'Connor would use to escape that day. Tommy Tui spent his idle hours with darling Dave O'Connor at a saloon on Hoying and Madison Streets in the Valley neighborhood where they were raised and boasted openly about providing the two guns for Tommy O'Connor's fabulous escape from prison. Tui even claimed that he had engineered the entire incident. O'Connor may not have needed the gun since it's commonly agreed that either he bribed his way out of his death cell or was simply let free by guards, one way or the other, his daring daylight escape was spectacular. Since it was a Sunday, the prisoners were allowed to walk in the yard for their exercise. The guard on duty in the yard was David Strauss, who later reported that Laporte and O'Connor stood up close to him when O'Connor said he was ill and needed a pass to the hospital. When the guard bent over to write the pass, Laporte and O'Connor jumped him from behind and then O'Connor whipped out a pistol and stuck it into the guard's ribs while Darrow took his keys. The other prisoners in the yard saw the escape and crowded around, but O'Connor turned his gun on them and ordered them back into their cell blocks. Then, O'Connor and his four men ran down the stairs and overpowered guards Charles Moore, Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Weta. They were all bound and gagged, but not before Weta managed to yell out, prisoner escaping, alerting the other guards on duty. On the run now, the prisoners scaled the wall by jumping on a shed and then over the nine-foot wall. Laporte, a heavy-set man, broke both of his ankles as he fell and was quickly recaptured. Darrow and McDermott fled in a different direction than O'Connor. They were recaptured by the police within a half hour. O'Connor escaped by leaping onto a passing car's running board. As he jumped, the clerk of the jail, Austin Jacobson, grabbed his coattail but let go when O'Connor spun around and pointed the gun at him. After the car turned the corner, Tommy O'Connor was gone. When questioned by police about the escape, Dave O'Connor, Tommy's father, said we knew the power of God would save Tommy and show the police and all the people that were against him that he was innocent. We're going to have a Merry Christmas at our home now. O'Connor did not escape, said Chicago's chief of police Fitzmorris. He was let out on the day he escaped from jail. O'Connor, or someone who looked like him, was spotted near the town of Richmond, Illinois. And O'Connor's cousin Jack O'Connor reported that someone had broken into his cottage near Fox Lake, spent the night, stole nothing, and left. On December 17, 1921, the body of a man was found under a bridge three miles north of Palmyra, Wisconsin, in rural Jefferson County, about 16 miles north of the town of Elkhorn. He had been shot with a .32 caliber revolver. The police theorized that O'Connor had forced his way into the man's car and then made him drive out across the state line. There, O'Connor found it more expedient to kill the man rather than face a kidnapping charge. The body was stripped of its clothes and wallet and left face down in the mud. That same day, O'Connor was seen driving out of Chicago with Bernie Grogan, the powerful boss of the 18th Democratic Ward, later the 20th Ward. The two were later spotted in the same car in Jefferson County where the body was found. Grogan came to power in 1911 and operated out of an unlicensed saloon at 1160 Van Buren Street, which was firebombed in 1923. Grogan was said to have driven O'Connor to his farm near Koshkanong, Wisconsin, and Grogan's housekeeper, Etta Berry, later identified the dead man as a guest at the farm with O'Connor. Remarkably, absolutely nothing happened with this information. 
Then a note arrived to the Chicago police from Milwaukee, written in Tommy O'Connor's hand, which said, Chief, don't send anybody after me. I am innocent. Much obliged to Strauss. I am gone, but my friends will reward him good luck to you all. I will be posted by friends and will shoot the first man who comes near me. On June 21, 1921, Big Tim Murphy, a labor racketeer who controlled several major railroad, laundry, and dye workers' unions during the 1910s and early 1920s, was arrested for his part in a $380,000 mail robbery, and, it was learned through wire phone taps, he was planning a second heist with Tommy O'Connor later in the year. A police informant, it was learned through the phone taps, named Murphy, was paying $125 a month for a third-floor apartment for O'Connor on behalf of Big Tim Murphy and his girlfriend on Sheridan Road near Irving Park Boulevard. When police learned that, they tapped the house phone lines and put the entire block under a 24-hour watch, hoping to catch O'Connor out in the open. The police rented an apartment across the street from the place he was supposed to be staying. They learned that the apartment had been rented in the name of Abe Myers, attorney at law. Actually, the person calling himself Myers was Abe Schaffner, part of the original Emerson gang that robbed the depot. After a week, police raided the apartment only to find O'Connor had in fact been there but was long gone. Murphy was eventually convicted and sentenced to seven years in prison for the robbery. On June 26, 1928, Murphy was shot and killed as he answered the front door of his home. On December 19, 1921, a note arrived for Harold or Wackham, a wealthy owner of a fruit packing company. He had placed a public reward of $100 to anyone who would lead the police to Tommy O'Connor. Someone placed a hand-delivered note in Wackham's mailbox telling him that if he didn't withdraw the offer he would be killed. Although police suspected a local crank of writing the note, Wackham was given round-the-clock police guards anyway. A day later, December 20th, 1921, police in Louisville, Kentucky identified a man who had leaped to his death from a bridge into the Ohio River as Tommy O'Connor. A detective from Chicago later disregarded the claim because the corpse had a long, jagged, and very old scar on its right hand which O'Connor did not have. On January 3rd, 1922, Alec Portman, a train brakeman, identified Tommy O'Connor as the man who boarded the engine car of a train and tried to rob it near Hoard in Iowa. Portman struggled with the gunman and tossed him from the train and the robber fled. That same week, on January 11th, 1922, on March 18th, 1922, Iowa police suspected that O'Connor was behind a rash of bank and postal robberies across the state and the U.S. Secret Service confirmed that O'Connor was linked to the robberies as well and that was the last that was ever heard of it. A few months later, police, acting on a tip that O'Connor was working as a cook in a railroad camp near Carkinville, Illinois, raided the camp and arrested a man named Sullivan, whom, they assured the Chicago police, was O'Connor. It was not. On April 18, 1922, Detroit police arrested John Kelly, another O'Connor look-alike. Chief of Detective Hughes drove to Detroit only to discover that the police had arrested the wrong man. In May, a man named John Drexel walked into the L.A. police headquarters and said that he had been one of Tommy O'Connor's getaway drivers during O'Connor's escape from prison. He said O'Connor used several getaway cars. He was held, determined to be insane, and released. On July 4th of 1922, a woman called the Chicago police and said that O'Connor was having a drink at Halstead and North Avenue. Dozens of police officers rushed to the site, but O'Connor wasn't there. In early December of 1922, Tommy O'Connor was reported to have been seen in Detroit and Gary, Indiana, in an apartment at 518 Washington Avenue, rented by a man named John Rees, where Chicago detectives, led by Detective John Ronan, raided an apartment, and according to them, they missed O'Connor by only moments. On December 10, 1922, O'Connor was reported to be in the town of Elkhorn, Wisconsin, where, 11 years later, a drunken Roger Tui and his gang ran into a telephone pole. A local policeman searched their car, found a small armory, and phoned the FBI, who promptly arrested Tui and company for the kidnapping of St. Paul brewer William Ham. On September 21, 1923, a man was held in Carlinville, Illinois, on suspicion of being Tommy O'Connor, but was released, and two months after that, on November 22, 1923, O'Connor was said to have been spotted in Texas by a man who said he recognized O'Connor from his photo in detective magazines. In 1924, a man named Mays found out that the man his daughter married was not named Ryan as he had said, but O'Connor. Ryan said he changed the name because he too was originally from Chicago and knew that he bore a striking resemblance to Terrible O'Connor, so he changed his name to Ryan. 
Further, Ryan said he knew O'Connor and was a friend of his and had visited him at the jail three days before his escape. Even more incriminating, the man had recently sold an unregistered revolver at a pawn shop. The most interesting claim came on January 29, 1927, when two Chicago hoods drove to Detroit and started a robbery campaign. The police found them as they were staging the last of 17 robberies that day. Six policemen gunned it out with the pair. One policeman was killed, and another seriously wounded. The shootout took place in front of the Garden Court Apartments on East Jefferson Street. The two gunmen entered a drugstore and demanded everyone present to lie down on the floor. However, one person, the store clerk, crawled out of the store through the back and phoned the police. Officer Stacy Misner and Officer Edward Goering walked into the store and said to one of the robbers, I understand there has been a stick up here, yes. There is one of the robbers responded, come back this way. Officer Goering stepped forward and the robber stuck a gun in his ribs, but Goering grabbed the gun and as the two men struggled, the second robber shot Goering in the back. Officer Misner opened fire and the two gunmen returned fire hitting Misner three times and killing him instantly. The robbers fled out the back door, but another policeman was waiting for them and fired three shots into one of the robbers, a man named Martin Dale. The second gunman listed only as Scotty in the newspaper accounts, but was probably Chicago gunman Ray O'Neill, ran across the street shooting but was gunned down by three other cops who had just arrived on the scene. They shot him 30 times. The first robber who was shot, a Chicagoan named Martin Dale, a rapist, car thief, and burglar, said as his dying words that the robberies had been framed for us as a cinch by Tommy O'Connor, and then he died. It was known that they had visited a prison in Jackson, Michigan, and it was assumed by some members of the there, Chicago that police O'Connor that O'Connor changed O'Connor. his name, moved to Kansas, allowed himself to be arrested for bank robbery, admitted to the crime, and spent five years in prison, long enough for the heat to die down. When he left prison, he left with a new although sullied name and a background. For many years, members of the Chicago police force assumed O'Connor had hidden in St. Paul's large underworld and then slipped over the Canadian border before traveling to Ireland. On April 11, 1922, the Niagara Falls police called the Chicago police and told them they were holding a man who looked exactly like Tommy O'Connor. The man provided them with a name, Edward Bieber, but refused to give them an address. However, he was released after 24 hours when no proof that he was O'Connor could be provided. The search for O'Connor went on although now mostly as a curiosity more than anything else. In 1930, a newspaper editor in Chicago let it be known in the underworld that he would pay big money for an interview with O'Connor, but that went no place. A year later, in 1931, O'Connor was said to be spotted in Mineola, Texas, but that turned out to be another false alarm. In 1933, he was reported in the press to be running Roger Toohey's kidnapping squad. In 1959, Tribune reporter John Gavin also reported that O'Connor was working with Roger Toohey. It is likely that the Toohey's hired O'Connor, at least for a short while. Most of the heavies in the Toohey gang, the gunmen and male robbers, were escaped convicts or were on the run from the law, including Toohey's top lieutenant Basil Hugh Bangert. Another report had O'Connor fleeing to the north woods of Minnesota and settling down. In 1937, rumors began to circulate that Tommy O'Connor had died of tuberculosis, a disease he had contacted as a child in Chicago, but the most oft-repeated story among those who knew him was that O'Connor had escaped to Canada and then back to Ireland, where he ran a bar until his dying day. He certainly knew a thing or two about running a bar since he all but lived at Charon's Saloon in Chicago and his father, Joseph, left a number of siblings back in Ballykinney that included his brothers James and Gerald and sisters Bridget, Elizabeth, and Mary. One long-standing story was that O'Connor fought on the side of Irish rebels and was killed by the British. Terrible Tommy O'Connor may have died in Chicago in 1951. The source of that rumor is a gravestone in the Holy Sepulchre Cemetery in Chicago. Under the tombstone lays one Thomas O'Connor who died on January 31, 1951. Buried next to him is his wife, Annie Connor, who passed away on February 16, 1956. Thomas and Irish-born Annie were both waked at a funeral home at 1136 West 87th Street in Chicago, but the management has changed several times since then and the funeral director has no record of the burial. A service was held for both of them at St. Killian's Church, 3200 East 91st Street in Chicago. The cemetery lists Thomas O'Connor's date of birth as March 10, 1880 in Ireland in the village of Kilcolman, Limerick, which is about a 20-minute car ride from Tommy O'Connor's birthplace in Monahea, Limerick. However, several times, the U.S. Census listed citizen Thomas O'Connor's birth year as 1881. Terrible Tommy O'Connor was born 10 years later in 1891. 
On another census, Citizen O'Connor listed his birth year as 1883. Citizen O'Connor said he arrived in the U.S. in 1905 and his wife in 1900 and that he worked as a municipal laborer. They lived at 8843 South Halstead Street, Chicago, about 10 minutes from the end of Polk and Damon where terrible Tommy O'Connor was raised and lived until he disappeared. The couple, who were married in 1919, is found at the same address in 1935. In the 1940 census, both were listed as 59 years old. Citizen O'Connor attended school up to the fifth grade. The significant difference is that Citizen Thomas had a brother, Richard according to the obit posted by the wife. However, there are no census records listing Thomas O'Connor with a brother Richard in the U.S. that matches the other data around the citizen named Thomas O'Connor. It should be mentioned that a quick look at the U.S. census records show at least a half dozen Thomas O'Connors who could match almost all of the above data. It is more than likely that the high-strung, rash O'Connor, who appears to have had a developing drinking problem and no skills, remained a criminal and was most likely killed in a caper gone wrong. Tommy O'Connor was the last person sentenced to die by hanging in Illinois. Due to lack of use, the gallows were disassembled, actually the wood had rotted by the mid-1960s, but by law could not be destroyed and were stored as a big pile of wood in a basement for over 70 years in the unlikely event that O'Connor ever resurfaced. In 1977, Judge Richard J. Fitzgerald decided that O'Connor was gone forever and ordered the gallows to be disposed. The city of Chicago sold the gallows to Donley Wild West Town in Union, Illinois, where they stayed for nearly 30 years.